My talk today is about twinning induced plasticity steels, but I will also uh, relate to another problem which involves uh, transformation induced plasticity. What do we mean by a twin? Well, supposing that I have a lattice uh, like this and I shear it homogeneously, then this part now reflects about the twin plane into the original structure. So this, this plane, this is a particular kind of twin that is quite common in, in the sort of uh, steels that I'm going to talk about, where you can generate the twin lattice by a reflection of the parent lattice across the twinning plane. And of course, uh, there's a physical deformation, which is a pure shear on the twin plane. The twinning system in austenite consists of uh, a twin plane, which is the closed back plane of the austenite, and a twinning direction within that plane, which is of the type 112. So I will illustrate that later, but that is the twinning direction, which is the 1, 1 bar 2 in this case. And the twin plane is the plane which remains unaffected by the twinning deformation, which is the 1, 1, 1 uh, plane of the austenite. And of course, we know that the 1, 1, 1 plane is closed backed, which means that uh, the atoms touch along all three directions and there's a high packing density inside that plane. Closed back planes are stacked above each other in the FCC structure of austenite in a sequence A, B, C, A, B, C. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, if, if in this particular plane, the atoms are located at positions A, then there is a, a sort of a dip in between these three atoms, which is a position B where the atoms in the plane above can lie or in a position C. If I translate just from A to A, that doesn't change the crystal structure, okay? So that is simply like slip happening along the 110 type directions. So that's the 110 type direction. A translation through that vector doesn't change the crystal structure. However, uh, this uh, direction A by 2110, where A is our lattice parameter, uh, can be split into two 112 type vectors here. A by 6, 2, 1, 1, and A by 6, 1, 2, bar 1. And if I translate the layer above this layer from this position, which is a, a C position, to a B position, then I actually change the crystal structure. I've introduced effectively a fault in the lattice. And if I carry out this translation on every single 111 plane, then the result is a twin, a mechanical twin in the austenite. So the displacement is A by 6, 2, 1, 1 here. Okay? And the distance over which that displacement happens normal to the closed back plane is the spacing of the 1, 1, 1 planes, which is A upon root 3. So the twinning shear is simply the displacement divided by the height over which it happens, which is 1 over square root of 2. Uh, or 0 .0, uh, 0 0.0.7071. So that is a very large shear deformation. If you recall uh, my lectures on martensite and bainite and so on, the shear was only about 0 0.26. This is 0 0.7071 or 1 upon root 2 to be exact. So twinning involves very large deformation, and that's why mechanical twins will always form in the form of very thin plates in order to minimize the strain energy. This plane here is our closed back plane, and I'm stacking them in a sequence A, B, C, A, B, C, uh, illustrated over here. So this represents our face-centered cubic crystal structure of austenite. Uh, and this is a, a repetition of that stacking sequence, A, B, C, A, B. And now I'm going to displace one of the, uh, I'm going to displace one half of that crystal relative to the other by uh, uh, one, a, a by 6, 1, 1, 2, and that results in this. So we have A, B, C, B, C, uh, and then conduct another displacement on, a, uh, on an adjacent uh, closed back plane, and that results in A, B, C, B, A. So 
Notice that about this twin plane C, I have reflected the crystal structure. So B reflects to B, A reflects to A. So this is our mechanical twin, and this lattice is a reflection about the twin plane of the parent structure. Crip steels. So this is a very classic paper. The reference to this will appear later in the um, presentation, showing austenite, which, deform, uh, which deforms by mechanical twinning and dislocation sleep. So this was a sample which was originally flat, and after deformation, you can see all the surface relief here caused by mechanical twinning in the different austenite grains. And in a transmission electron micrograph, these twins are extremely thin okay, because of the very large shear deformation. And of course, you also have uh, an increase in dislocation density because it's not just twinning alone, but also dislocation slip that occurs uh, at the sort of deformations we subject twinning induced plasticity steels too. I'll tell you the composition later, but these are quite remarkable materials because look, uh, this is a, a stress strain curve uh, yielding, uh, the yield strength in this particular case is really quite small, it's about 300 megapascals, but you can continue the deformation until the strength exceeds 1.2 gigapascals and maintain an elongation of something like 60%. Okay, So this is quite a remarkable combination of properties, an elongation of 60% and a strength of 1.2 gigapascals. But it starts off at a low yield strength, and then it looks like there is a steady work hardening rate as you continue deformation. So what is the reason we don't get an early plastic instability? You know, just like in normal normal steels, you don't get to 60% elongation at this level of strength. Well, what's happening is something known as a dynamic hole patch effect. In other words, the formation of the mechanical twins effectively reduces the grain size of the austenite. So as the twins form, the effective grain size in the hole patch equation is decreasing during the course of deformation. And that is what gives us the work hardening that prevents an early onset of plastic instability. So we are not transforming this austenite at all into martensite or anything like that. It's just mechanical twinning, refining the effective grain size as deformation proceeds. And the mechanical properties are quite remarkable apart from the strength and elongation. You know, if, if you look at uh, the impact energy as a function of temperature, there's virtually no change here as a function of temperature. Because, um, you know, if you recall what I said about uh, the ductile brittle transition temperature, the austenite does not have a ductile brittle transition temperature because the flow stress always remains below the cleavage strength. So grip steels, typical composition is 25 manganese, three silicon and three aluminium. If you only had the manganese uh, and the iron, uh, you would still get it fully osnetic, but it would tend to undergo phase transformation to epsilon martensite as you deform. But the addition of these uh, further elements, uh, there are various reasons for adding these elements. But one, one reason is that you remain fully austenitic as you deform. Now, because silicon and aluminium uh, have low atomic rates, the overall density is actually reduced quite significantly. So the norm, normal iron has a, a density of about 7.8 grams per centimeter cube. This is 7.3 grams per centimeter cube, and it's fully austenitic and maintains its properties to cryogenic temperatures. So one application for crib steels with POSCO as uh, considered is the uh, pressure vessels used to carry liquid, liquefied gas. Okay, they are usually made from 9% uh, nickel steel, but they have also made them from TWIP steel. 
And of course, uh, you know, as you lower the temperature, there's no significant change in toughness. Therefore, there's also no significant change in toughness as you increase the strain rate. So to 10 to the power of three per second. Now, everything looked uh, very promising for these trip steels for many years uh, for automotive applications, because you know uh, if you have a large elongation and a large strength, then that's a good thing for formability. But when some components were made, they tended to crack spontaneously uh, after a certain period of time. So this is known as static fracture. And it's illustrated here in a cup that has been drawn out by, um, uh, drawn out from trip steel. So this is a 22 manganese 0.6 carbon trip steel. And after an unpredictable amount of time, the cup simply cracks up. Now the purpose of drawing out a cup is that you also have residual stresses inside that drawn cup. That combined with something else causes this static fracture. But the addition of aluminium uh, gets over the problem. However, when the static fracture problem was highlighted, uh, the automotive industry basically abandoned trip steels because they thought of them as being unreliable. The problem is actually solved, you know, um, by the addition of aluminium. And there are various ideas on how this stops this mechanism of fracture, which is associated with hydrogen embrittlement. Okay? So this kind of fracture can be accelerated by introducing further hydrogen into the material. Um, so there must be something about aluminium which prevents that hydrogen embrittlement of austenite. And there are various uh, models for this, but one which is really interesting is that the aluminum atom causes a localized expansion around it. So for example, if this is our face-centered cubic unit cell, and these are the heights of the atoms, these are the face-centering atoms, uh, then the distance between the iron atoms and the aluminum atoms is larger than between the iron iron atoms. So there's more space created in the interstices between the substitutional atoms. And that is where hydrogen gets trapped. So it's a, it's a deeper trap for hydrogen than inside the lattice. And therefore, you prevent hydrogen enrichment of TWIP stills. Now, although I said that, uh, you know, automotive applications have essentially been abandoned for trip steels, people tried to create uh, um, crash resistance using trip steels because, you know, they can continue to deform to a large degree of deformation. So the kind of objects I'm talking about, uh, on this side we have a composite material, on this side we have a steel, and what you do is you want the material to absorb energy. In the case of the composite, it's by breaking interfaces between uh, the composite uh, components. And in the case of steel, by forming this concertinated structure, which basically absorbs energy by deformation. Now, the problem with uh, trip steel is that its strength only rises gradually. Whereas in this kind of a scenario, you are only putting large strains in localized regions. And therefore, you don't absorb as much energy as you would expect if you had a curve which was flat like this, except near the yield region. So this application doesn't prove to be successful. Um, however, some very clever engineering by the German railway system has provided a new kind of an application for trip steel, where in a crash scenario, the whole of the material would deform uniformly. Now, how did they find this engineering solution? Well, these are the crash uh, energy, uh, absorbing devices in uh, a railway tram, a railway carriage, 
And what you do is you have these pipes made out of drip steel, TWIP steel, and during a crash, these pipes get extruded through dyes, and therefore the drip steel is uniformly deformed everywhere up to its maximum capacity. Uh, trip and twip uh, involve transformation or twinning deformations caused by an externally applied stress, and both of them work by increasing the work hardening capacity of the material. And they both lead to, therefore, to greater strength and greater ductility. Now, I want to change the subject a little. Uh, here, in all the examples, both in trip steels and trip steels, we are exploiting the phenomena by physically deforming the material uh, using an externally applied stress. Now, is it possible that stresses that are generated when constrained components cool, in other words, residual stresses, they themselves can trigger these effects and therefore cancel out the residual stresses? Okay? I want to show you an example where transformation-induced plasticity is used to stop the accumulation of residual stress as large components which are constrained are uh, locally heated or cooled. So welding is uh, an obvious example because we take two bits of steel and in between we put liquid metal, the liquid solidifies, and these, if, if your component is large, then these parts don't really want to move as the weld contracts and therefore you accumulate stress. So that's illustrated over here. Uh, liquid can of course flow, so there is zero stress uh, when this well pool is liquid. As soon as it solidifies uh, and the temperature drops, it will start contraction and therefore you will build up a residual stress. And residual stresses can be very bad for the component in several different ways. So uh, if there are any stress concentrations, they induce fatigue, failure, uh, because the applied stress will be complemented by the residual stress. It also means that the stress that you apply to the component has to be smaller than you would expect from the yield strength of the material used to make the component. So is there any way that we can compensate for this kind of thermal contraction where after solidification, you basically build up stress simply because these two ends are completely constrained. So if this is a very large assembly, you know, like, like uh, uh, one of these uh, platforms or your welding pipelines, etc., then residual stresses can be extremely important in your design process. Okay, so imagine that we have a sample here, which is an austenitic stainless steel and remains austenitic at all temperatures. So this was a classic experiment done in 1977 by Albrey and Jones, where they heated this tensile sample to a high temperature and then physically fixed it and allowed it to contract. And as it contracts, you get an accumulation of stress. Uh, it's not, uh, if it was only thermal contraction, this stress would rise rapidly. But at high temperatures, some of the thermal contraction is accommodated by ordinary plastic deformation. Okay, so. The rise in stress is lower than you would expect, but nevertheless significant at about 300 megapascals. Now, supposing you do the same experiment with a steel which transforms during the cooling process. Okay? So this is now a bainitic steel, and once again we get uh, the rise in stress due to thermal contraction, but as soon as we get the onset of phase transformation, that compensates for the um, thermal contraction and we get a reduction in stress. However, when the phase transformation is exhausted, that means all the austenite has gone, the stress begins to rise rapidly okay, and we end up with a larger residual stress at room temperature. Okay, so what happens if we lower this transformation temperature? So instead of bainite, if we now produce martensite, uh, once again, the same phenomenon until we get phase transformation, 
we cancel out the effects of thermal contraction. And because the transformation is exhausted at a lower temperature, we end up with a smaller residual stress. So this gives you an idea on how to design a welding alloy that would leave your component with a zero residual stress at ambient temperature. All you have to do is move this point to somewhere along here. Okay, so cause the phase transformation to happen at a temperature of around 200 degrees centigrade, uh, and all the austenite should be used up by the time you get to ambient temperature, because we don't want retained austenite left. Now, when designing a welding consumable, you can't simply just alter the transformation temperature. You have to look at a very large range of mechanical properties which have to be satisfied. For example, the toughness measured in either of these ways, or the fatigue properties, corrosion properties, etc. So a design problem is never simply a single parameter. And that is where, you know, graphene has gone so badly wrong that they were looking at the strength of a carbon-carbon bond and then claiming all sorts of things. But you can't actually use that at all for structural applications. You have to have a whole bank of properties in order to make something useful. Okay, so how do we uh, do this? Uh, well, uh, we have a lot of uh, experience in designing welding alloys. Uh, and this is a commercial alloy, uh, quite straightforward. All of these contain uh, a very low carbon concentration because we don't want to produce uh, martensite. Um, there's a certain amount of silicon and manganese added for deoxidation because remember, you're pouring the liquid without any of the normal refining processes that we implement for normal steels. And there's a certain amount of uh, hardenability required to avoid high temperature phases. So this is a commercial electrode, which transforms at a high temperature of about 450 degrees centigrade. These are three alloys which transform at low temperatures. Uh, and you can see that the nickel concentration here is quite high, okay? Uh, to force the transformation temperature to a lower temperature. Now, the first thing that a steels person will say is that, look, uh, nickel is expensive. But remember that the amount of welding material you use is not very large, right? And furthermore, if you increase the life of the component, then the overall cost is actually reduced. So never just look at the cost of an alloying element. Look at the benefits that it produces and whether if you look at the whole life cost, is that reduced? So we designed these three alloys and decided to repeat the Aubrey and Jones type experiment, but this time also using X-ray diffraction to follow the phase transformations and various other features of the behavior as the material cools. So this is a, a effectively a dilatometer that is attached to a beam line at uh, Grenoble. So there's a high energy X-ray, X-rays coming out from here. And this is our sample positioned inside the dilatometer. And we can, we can monitor everything that happens, the stress, the, all the information from the high energy X-rays and so on as the cooling happens. So it's straightforward from X-ray diffraction to calculate how much austenite you get and how much ferret you, uh, ferritic transformation products you get as the material cools quantitatively, okay? So I'm going to show you now the Aubrey and Jones type curves taken using the technique that I've described. So first of all, this is our control electrode which transforms at a high temperature. And you can see that you're left with a large level of residual stress in the specimen by the time it reaches ambient temperature because the transformation is exhausted at this point. For all the other alloys, uh, where the transformation temperature is of the order of 200 degrees centigrade or lower, we end up with almost zero stress or even a compressive stress at room temperature. Now, of course, these are tensile specimens. And what you've got to do is prove this for an actual well material. 
And these stem cell specimens are, are roughly, uh, roughly five millimeters in diameter because the X-rays can then penetrate the whole of the specimen. Whereas a weld will be a much larger object which cannot be penetrated by X-rays. So we went to Chalk River in Canada to make measurements of residual stress inside actual wells. And these are the results. This is our control electrode. And you can see that we've got large tensile stresses here uh, in, and, uh, in the heat affected zone and so forth. And this is the low, these, are, these two are the low temperature transforming uh, welding alloys. And look, we've got minus 600 megapascals of compressive stress here. And similarly, minus 600 here. OK, so this method actually works and there are many tests now in the literature. Uh, you know, going from the work of Ota and so forth, we show that actually the fatigue properties are improved because of this compressive stress system that you develop. Now, supposing that we wanted to design so these are uh, actually transformed into ferritic transformation products. Uh, but supposing we wanted to design a stainless steel and, uh, containing a large chromium concentration. Okay, So we need a chromium concentration greater than 12 weight percent because that uh, gives you a reliable, coherent and adherent chromium oxide film on the surface, which regenerates if it is scratched. We must have uh, virtually zero carbon concentration because uh, of the problem of carbides forming, uh, chromium carbides forming. Uh, we need a low martensite start temperature, but not too low so that we can exploit the full capacity of the phase transformation. And we need to suppress the martensite start temperature with solutes other than carbon. But at some temperature, it must be capable of being fully osmotic. Now, if you if you add lots of chromium, then you can end up with some delta ferrite, which remains stable at all temperatures. So we need to balance the alloy so that it can become fully osmotic at high temperatures. And it's important that it solidifies as delta ferrite because sometimes uh, delta ferrite can absorb impurities, right? And therefore, you stop hot cracking of the welding alloy. Whereas if it solidifies as austenite, austenite rejects the impurities into the liquid, and therefore you tend to solidify the liquid at too low a temperature, and you get hot cracking developing as the whirlpool cools. So we designed uh, uh, these alloys here. Uh, this has a, a very low carbon concentration, chromium 12%, uh, 4% nickel so to ensure that it becomes austenitic at high temperatures and otherwise very, very simple. Now, this is uh, a composition specification, really, uh, that uh, is for martensitic stainless steels, right? But we don't want a very large carbon concentration. So you can see that the transformation happens at a low temperature, okay? Both of these alloys transform at a low temperature, which is exactly what we want. But these are stainless steels. And residual stress has two effects. One is that you have a locked in stress system, which reduces your design parameters. It is that you can get uh, ugly distortion of your welded component. So here, for example, you can see that these plates, which were originally lying flat on the surface, after welding, they have developed a distortion with a, a, an angle between these two. And if you use a welding material which remains fully osmotic uh, up to room temperature, then you get a large distortion. By using this low temperature transforming alloy, you dramatically reduce the distortion and therefore also the residual stresses if this component was large. So I'll finish uh, the lecture there.